All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, for the first in a series of discussions, um, for something that is very near and dear to our hearts, um, entrepreneurship, economic uh, inclusion. Hi, Andre, I see you there. Uh, hi, Judy. Judy Wicks, I see you there. Adam L Landau. Oh, we got a good, we got a good room here. Marquita Lewis. Oh, we got chemists in the room. I might get a freestyle. Um, <laughs> as, as I was saying, um, these are issues that are very near and dear to our heart at Little Giant Creative. Um, my partner Megan and I have been working um, diligently, I would say for the past five years. It's probably longer than that because when you get to my age, everything is five years ago. Um, but we wanted to invite Andre um, to talk about his new book, um, Know Your Price. I think it is, is um, a brilliant uh, exploration of things that we all have experienced um, with the lived experience of harm. Um, and I think often when people uh, look at our communities, frankly, it's through a white gaze um, and a pathology about um, the problems with black people. Um, and I, I, I could expound on that. And um, I see a lot of faces that have heard me expound and rant on that at different times. But today's is about Andre um, and Know Your Price. But before I do that, um, Senator Hughes, are, are you in the room? I'm in the room. Um, I am in the room, Mr. Tay. I, I invited Senator Hughes uh, to join the discussion because he's a, a brother in arms and somebody who's been doing this work long before me um, to talk about, um, to contextualize these issues um, that affect black communities in particular, but to contextualize that within the context of the new normal post COVID. Um, so without saying too much, uh, Senator Hughes, can you let the people know what's on, on your mind? Oh, goodness, what's not on my mind? What's on my mind is too many damn Zoom meetings. That's what's on my mind, all right? <laughs> but if I call you, you're going to do my Zooms, but go on. Of course. Well, I'm on yours, all right? All right? So um, and thank you, Fatay, for putting this together. Um, I just left a Zoomed Senate Democratic Caucus meeting uh, in Harrisburg talking about what's coming down uh, and at the state capitol. Uh, Got to thank Brother Perry for this work. Um, I'm not sure he knew uh, when he was putting this together how important and how relevant it would be um, at this particular moment. Um, just a little bit of uh, assessment, if you will, of why this is important at this, and even more so at this time, given everything that we've gone, we, we are going through. Um, we, we obviously, I think we all know it. Um, I'll try to confirm it. Uh, but if we're haphazard with dealing with COVID-19, um, if we rush everybody back and we resume as normal and what have you, uh, this disease is going to center itself um, and place itself squarely in black and brown communities, okay? Um, uh, black and brown communities, seniors, poor people, that's where this, this disease is going to uh, um, hold court and hold folks hostage. Uh, and so, so as we draft policy, um, it is not about returning to normal. Um, it really is about how we reconstruct, to coin a phrase, um, what we want community to be like going forward. Um, there is, uh, and so in that context, um, uh, Brother Perry's work comes forward uh, and for policymakers, it kind of enlightens us and gives us some direction um, and context about how we need to be driving stuff um, because going backward, what won't, won't work to what was normal is not gonna work about going forward about what we want to be and what we need to, to have and what the vision, the vision of what we want for, for community needs to be. 
what Brother Perry's work does, it helps inform us, it helps set the stage, it helps give us some, some heft um, to policy conversations that um, have to be had and decisions that will have to be made. Um, I could go on and on and I, and I won't um, about um, the attacks on democracy, which is one of the last vestiges that we have left available to defend and advance ourselves. Um, the vote by mail thing is, is um, incredibly challenging. Uh, of the 94% of, of the people who have responded uh, to um, vote by mail and getting their votes in are white, 4% uh, are, are black across the entire state of Pennsylvania. Did you say 4%, sir? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, and that relates to a whole lot of different things. And this is Andre's program, so I'm not going to do that to him. Okay. But what I am going to say, what I am going to say, all of this comes together. All of this comes together. Um, and as we've all said that uh, what COVID-19 has done is exposed the cracks and the fissures that existed between our healthcare reality, but it also exposes everything else. And now we have some more data, more information, more context to help drive us forward. Um, and that's the reason why I left 20 other Democratic senators on a call, on a meeting, to be part of this conversation for a few minutes um, so that um, I can be enlightened and share whatever it is that I can share um, about moving community forward. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is time that we be bold. Um, that we be aggressive, uh, that we not negotiate against ourselves in terms of these conversations, um, that we um, aggressively advance the realities that exist and the solutions that are necessary. Um, and Brother Perry's work helps illuminate and gives us some direction, gives us some heft. Um, and I'm glad to just have this, these few minutes to, to say more than anything. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you, brother. Um, <coughs> I was remiss, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I tend to get too hyped. I didn't introduce um, my partner, Megan Denenberg, who's also on the call. And um, I'm, Megan, if you could say a couple words just about IF Lab, um, the series in the lab, and uh, how this all relates to entrepreneurs in particular. Uh, yeah. Yep. So. I think I have to start by apologizing because I'm sort of like the accounting agency at the Oscars. I'm always kind of filled with the, the, the boring information. Um, but just bear with me and it'll be over soon. So I, I wanted to give context to what this is because very often uh, Taib and I develop a lot of disparate, seemingly disparate initiatives and there is a cohesive glue that pulls it all together and just wanted to make sure that we, we put some context to what uh, In The Lab series is. Um, I think most of you on this call know, I know many of you as well, um, that Little Giant is a creative agency that was founded and managed entirely by people of color uh, with a staff truly reflective of who lives in our city and our country, something that doesn't actually happen that often. We develop strategies that lead with cultural competency and view the multicultural markets as general market. If Lab was born by Taib and I, our lived experience and observations as entrepreneurs of color. It's a place-based entrepreneurial incubator that meets people where they are in the development of their business, in the communities they live, and with a founding structure that, that reflects the people it serves. If Lab provides professional support and bridges for the underserved entrepreneur to resources, institutions, critically language, and people, um, and our first uh, in Incubator is going to be located in Kensington um, in a building called J Central that Taib and I also have co-developed. So during these uncertain times where the vulnerabilities of small business owners and in particular of underrepresented small business owners are being highlighted in the most devastating ways, um, If Lab and Taib and I have developed the In the Lab series, which are digital conversations for Philadelphia minority entrepreneurs and invested industry professionals to have intimate interactive, non-academic colloquiums with international and national experts in a variety of fields. We want it to be an accessible platform for conversations to get into the nucleus of topics and needs and provides the following three things. Content to expand networks and professional resources while homebound and the necessary pending potential of pivoting and adapting in an uncertain new world. 
to build an intentional, incredible network with like-minded professionals and connect local entrepreneurs with a larger ecosystem. And really at the end of the day, what Taib and I like to say, we'd like to stop meeting about meetings and talking about talking, and we'd actually like to start doing. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to my co-founder and business partner, Taib Smith, for our first ever In the Lab with Andre Perry. Damn, that was, that, that was good. She good. Mm -hmm. uh, Andre, are you with me, brother? I'm with you. Can you, are, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Um, Very good. Yeah, it, uh, thank you for, for doing this. I really appreciate you. Um, I think the first time we interacted, you came to Philadelphia, to WHYY, actually to be a part of the Dream Deferred series. Uh, the the yeah. second time we, we did a panel at the City Archives um, to talk about some of these same issues. And then you came out with this. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, t I t tend to think in, uh, in the language of hip hop, right? And right now you would be one of my favorite MCs. <laughs> Along with uh, Kanyenga Taylor, who just won the Pulitzer last week. That's right. Or, uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, it escapes me. Uh, yeah. Uh, the housing book of report. <laughs> it also speaks to these very same issues, uh, and particularly around redlining. Uh, a sister who lives in Mount Airy and is just across the bridge at Princeton teaching. But um, similar to you, when I'm in rooms where people are talking about, um, as I say, the pathology of the Black community's condition, I don't see um, people with the lived experience of the harm, such as yourself, being lifted up. Uh, so can you tell me, uh, just to kick off, what inspired you? Yeah. yeah, first I want to send um, a shout out to Senator Hughes. Thank, thank you for your leadership. Um, also, um, the, um, Taib and uh, Megan and, um, and all that helped to put this together. This is wonderful. This is um, uh, it has been an, an incredible journey, but I'll 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 pick up right I'll, where I ended off in a conversation with a colleague at from Harvard. Um, we were debating um, a, a report that's going to come out, another housing report that I'm about to drop, and uh, the professor said, "Why didn't you put that in your book? I wanted to see more of the wonky stuff." And I said, "Well." Um, because this is personal for me. You know, this is very personal um, for me that the tragedies that we're seeing all over the country, um, Armand, um, Aubrey, um, for instance, just brutally slain in the streets, that this, this work has to run through our lived experience instead of going against it, which it always does. And when, when we do run things through the lived experience, we find out that the people actually know something. You know, most people, they become familiar with me through either two ways, through education or housing. In, in housing, I had the report, and, and most of you know, but I'll repeat it, that we, we compared housing prices in black neighborhoods and we compared them in white neighborhoods. And we, we controlled for all those fancy Zillow metrics and we controlled for crime and and education and all those reasons why they say homes in black neighborhoods are less. And what we found pretty much astounds that homes in, in black neighborhoods are devalued by 23%, about 48,000 per home, about 156 billion in lost equity, 156 billion. Now that amounts to about 4.4 um, million startup businesses It would have funded um, 8 million four-year degrees. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan more than 3,000 times over. It's twice the amount of what we pay for in the uh, opioid epidemic. It's a big number. Um, this is the money that's being robbed from Black Americans, from Black people, um, um, because of racism. It's the money that should be used to lift ourselves up. Um, and so I responded to him is like, look, you know, when we put out this research and you're saying how um, black people need to do this and black people do need to do that, you're talking to me. 
So I need to share my story to show you um, how we um, um, are impacted by this. You know, and I also, I sit at Brookings and we put out essentially uh, reports that um, defy the black lived experience. And, and it's a very diverse place, Brookings. We have folks who are more in line with my range of thinking. And we have folks who are willing to remix the Moynihan report about 50,000 times, you know, and, and base, you know, and it's, and for me, it's like, they're talking about me. You know, when you say um, your family structure is broken, your, if you can, if, if you did, if your community did X, Y, and Z, um, you're, you're talking about me and my family and my people. And so, so for me, it's very personal. So I took a very personal approach. Right. So um, I know a lot of people haven't had the opportunity yeah. to get the book as of yet, but when you talk about the personal, there are 70, several different uh, spaces in the book where you, where you touch on um, learning about your father's experience uh, with incarceration, um, speaking about the collective experience of fictive kin yeah. uh, in the Black community. Uh, we, we often um, are closer with people who might not be our blood. Uh, yeah. you, uh, and something that is like a, a, a reoccurring reframe is that you, you, you deal with a personal reckoning, right? So you spoke about sometimes people will remix the, the Moynihan report, but there's a portion in the book where you are that bureaucrat, you are that administrator yeah. in the, the system of uh, education. Can, can you speak to yeah. um, what are some of the things that brought you to that reckoning or brought you to that truth? Because oftentimes when people are talking about these issues, they don't place themselves um, within the, the narrative of not necessarily being a hero. Yeah, yeah. So, and Trey um, Johnson, I think, I, I, I know he's out there. Yeah, Trey's can, here. Yeah, Trey, Trey can speak to this because he, he writes on education, used to write on education. Um, I used to be a school leader in New Orleans. And um, at the time, I really, and I still do believe black people need education reform. We need education reform. The, the system was not built for us. Let's be clear about that. And so after the storm, I, you know, I'm a PhD in, um, po in policy, ed policy. The dean of the ed school said, hey, Andre, we would love for you to run our charter schools. So I'm running them and I'm actually running them more like laboratory schools, community schools. But after the storm, the national movement came in and they re and you really started to get a sense that it, they want a, a brand of sort of the privatizing, you know, the what you hear about, the negative things you hear about charter schools. And I was in the same room with folks who were essentially firing people, um, black people, um, that um, suspended black children um, uh, left and right. The, the, the expulsion rate went way up. But most importantly, we were letting go of black talent because we could not envision black people being a part of New Orleans' future moving forward. If we were going to improve, we had to make it less black. And that, and that evidence was shown in the drop in black educators after the storm, it went from 70 something percent to about 50 something percent, um, amounting to between anywhere between three or 5% of the middle class population lost. Now, um, I was a part of that. And so I, you know, I always say, you know, I didn't want to write a book and it's not a complete memoir. There are parts where I introduce myself, but and throughout the book, I apologize several times to people I have harmed with a negative view of black people. Um, now, um, there's no going back, but I say everyone has an opportunity to atone, to so, make right. Uh, uh, to speak to that, that is one of my favorite things about the book, because I think in our personal narratives, we all write ourselves as the hero in our own novel. Yeah. Um, and for me, those moments where you speak of where you might not have been right. You know, I, I think you talk about um, some of the challenges that 
you and your wife had um, dealing with, with reproductive justice issues. Uh, and you talk about uh, some of the path pathology through a male lens of, of that responsibility. Um, I, I just really appreciate yeah. that. Well, I, yeah, and that was, you know, and that was somewhat hard for me for those, you, you're probably gonna read that there's no surprise here. Um, my wife and I struggle to have children and, um, and we, we eventually ended up um, having a gestational carrier. Other, I mean, people know it as a surrogate. A surrogate is a little bit different, but gestational carrier. But throughout the pregnancy, she was going through a tremendous amount of legal stress. Um, make a long story short, her, the hospital really went after her. Um, I'll just say that Louisiana is a conservative state when it comes to things like abortion, with, when it comes to things like uh, reproductive justice that my wife promotes, and they went after her. But, and this is during, all during the time when she's having, we're trying to have a child. And when she didn't, you know, I was asking her, what are you eating? What are you drinking? What are you doing all the, <laughs> I was blaming her, you know, and and so, and, but that was the same type of blame the folks that were going after her were doing. They were blaming black women mm -hmm. um, for the state of, what, of whatever. And, and so that's another part of the, the story I own up to. Um, you know, I love my wife, don't get me wrong, but it's to say that we all buy into this horrible narrative that the condition of black cities and black families are a direct result of the people. And not knowing really at the time how these overarching structures and narratives are impacting our thinking and impacting our policy. So in that particular chapter, I talk about, hey, if we really want to improve maternal mortality, the, the goal is not to blame black women, and, and it's clear, and in, in if you have done any kind of reading in this area, you know that black women can't buy or educate their way to better birthing outcomes. We need to remove the structures of, pr of bad prisons, bad schools, bad um, um, pay or economic policy. All these things are throttling um, outcomes, but for women, it shows up in birthing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so... You know, I, you know, and I take ownership of all that. You know, I, I think I'm at a place now that, um, and this is what I wanted to do for my colleagues even more so. When you write about Black people, you better include your perspective. You better include your background. So we really know uh, what, you, what we're dealing with. We talk about researchers being these dispassion, dispassionate, above the fray people. And, and um, Brittany Cooper said it best, I put it in the book, that there's nothing rigorous about white supremacy. Whiteness gets in the way of rigor. Whiteness gets in the way of quality. That's why, and again, you know, going back to education, I, did, I really didn't have a problem with education reform. I had a problem with white education reform <laughs> that got in the way of doing great things. And, and, but when you go, when you speak that, oh man, folks come after you. I mean, it's like, you know, it, and I was just basically saying, yo, we're, the people I'm friends with are losing their jobs because of our reforms. The, the, the woman I love is not, um, having a great outcome because of our perspe my perspective. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to move forward, researchers must change their, um, or own up to the biases that they hold. Um, I, th I think I saw Oscar in the list he, um, um, for Next City. Um, he wrote a piece and he included that section. I was so glad in his review that he included that because I wanted, I really want researchers to understand that the, our methods are not clean of our privilege and our culture 
in our narratives. It is not. And you can take the same methods. And if you have a, a, a person that has no racial equity lens, it can do absolute complete harm to an entire community, to an entire country. I, I, and you have somebody with the, with a racial equity lens and it can be absolutely wonderful. So, so to speak to that, um, even those who perceive themselves to be the most woke, who have a racial equity lens, um, I personally have experienced times where, um, let's say people of privilege will speak to me as if I am a person who holds the privilege in the room. And mm-hmm. they will make assumptions about uh, my lineage, my education, the zip codes I grew up in, and my, my lived experiences. Um, and they will speak to me. And these, these sometimes are, are people of color as well. Yeah. Will speak to me through that lens of pathology that the children I'm attempting to advocate for do not have the intellectual capacity to rise to the occasion to participate in the 21st century economy. And by that, I mean, there are a lot of um, narratives around um, soft skills or narratives around workforce development that betray the reality of uh, the inequality in how our school districts are funded. Um, So, there's a lot I could say about that. Right? But, let me add, because one of the, uh, our one edu- uh, education article I wrote years ago, and it was when the whole grit stuff came out. And I, you know, and I, and the, the title was kids don't need to learn grit. They need, schools need to stop being racist or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, that we carry so many assumptions about black children, black adults, and what they need. And we never ask them, uh, what do you need to, to, in order to grow? What, you know, and it's really just about leaving yourself open to the diversity of black folk, to the range of personalities of black folk. Um, the one thing, because black folk are diverse, we are like all over the map. One thing we got in common is that people judge us similarly, mm-hmm. that they lump, they essentialize us in this in this like unwieldy, unreasonable way. And it could be um, a good thing sometimes, or it can be bad, but they always essentialize us. We're never individual. You, you have, a, uh, I'll call it a bar. In, in okay. the book. Yeah. Ty, can I just jump in for one second? Cause yeah. I know I'm a wet blanket. This conversation is fire, but <laughs> you, I do want everyone to, to understand that this is, this is an interactive conversation. And as uh, Andre and uh, Tayyib are talking, we would like to feel or comments. Um, and then uh, we're going to be channeling them to Andre and Tayyib as they speak so that there can be a little bit more um, uh, of participation and contribution from all the amazing people o- on the line. So I just wanted to add that we were supposed to say that in the beginning yeah. and I really want you to feel included. Okay, back, back to fire, bye. And I appreciate that. Um, and chemists, if, if it wasn't for Megan, I'd probably be still be dealing with trap rappers. So <laughs> um, on point. Um, something real quick I wanted to say, cause I keep seeing it. I see Melissa Robbins there, like throwing up her hand and clapping when you say certain things. And the cover of the book looks like uh, Melissa Robbins' hair. It also <laughs> looks like Marquia Lewis on, on certain occasions. Um, and throughout the book, you speak to, um, I would say through public policy, the violence particularly on Black women. So there's a part where you talk yeah. about Black uh, girls being um, expelled going to detention at, at the, the highest rates. Um, you, you, you keep going back on a refrain about, um, you know, black babies or black mortality rates through pregnancy. Um, and then when I first saw the book with the uh, black woman's Afro, with the cityscape there, I didn't really get it. But similar to an album, it's like once I read the book, it, res- it resonates. It yeah. Is- 
beautiful way. I just wanted to turn it to give you props. Oh, but 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 let me tell you, uh, it 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 wasn't by design, really, in this regard. After writing the book, some the editor was like, "Wow." you know, you're not a feminist person. This isn't a feminist manifesto, but I really uplift women. And it, it was, be, and it's re really because I start off with the story of how this older woman from Wilkinsburg took me in and she valued me. She saw the value in me when others did not. In school, it was women that saw the value in me. In politics, it's the women who see the value in me. In, in all these different things. And I was just being honest. And even my wife, she was like, wow, th there's a lot of, there's a lot of good here around um, a, a male perspective, but honoring women. And I said, well, the cover has to represent that then. So, and so uh, that's what I did. Just to honor some women, I want to shout out Tempest Carter, Iola Harper, Shakira King, Mikhail Solomon, Miami, Kiera Smalls. I see Lauren Hood in Detroit. Um, a, 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 a Judy Wicks, who's like right down the block. You're, you're like a, a block and a half from me right now. Oh. Um, so yeah, I, I you know, and of course my partner Megan. Um, yeah, where where were we without um, these women? Yeah, but um, one more thing I wanted to say, um, the other piece I try to do is show how entire cities are devalued. And, you know, uh, Chase is out there that um, w my father, he, he was murdered in, in Detroit. And, Sorry. you know, and um, so I've been going back quite a bit and meeting the people of Detroit doing incredible work. And when you're f not from there, you hear so much about what's wrong with the city of Detroit. <laughs> and then when you get there, you, s you really see the structures that, are, that throttle Detroiters' success. And it is not a, it's not a game in Detroit. I mean, it is corporations not valuing black people it's it's the state you know I, I lived for a little bit on the eastern side of this um state they hate detroit they do everything to to buck detroit you know so you have entire cities that are devalued and you know and clearly my research shows that with the higher concentration of blackness it, you, you see greater devaluation, not a, a, a lowering of quality in terms of businesses, in terms of housing prices, in terms of talent overall, but you do see a devaluation. And that's occurring at a city level. So, you know, we're gonna have to, to stand up because um, remember it was during uh, uh, Trump's campaign when he was a presumptive nominee and he was in Diamonddale, Michigan, and he was talking about what do, uh, black black people have to lose. There's nothing there. Well, you know, there is billions of dollars in housing stock in Detroit, and bill and billions of dollars worth of talent. What do you mean? There's nothing to lose. There's, but trust me, if there was, you know, as soon as a few white people move in, that's when you see investment. So and I, and, and and so. I, I yeah, wanna, I'm going off. I'm going off on a tangent. I, I want to mention that the last time I was in Detroit, um, it was through a, a Knight Foundation asked me to speak at an event, and I was in, in Midtown Detroit at um, a little coffee shop slash bar uh, um, that I'm sure Chase knows which I'm, what I'm talking about. And um, I had gone to a bookstore prior. I didn't have anything to do, so I had my books with me. I could order coffee and I could order drinks. So I was like, I'm good for three hours. And in that three hours, um, the only other African-Americans who came into the space were the people who I found out once they took their coats off, they were working there. And then um, about three other African-Americans came in that time period and they were homeless people trying to get out of the cold. Um, and the next day I had to speak um, to an audience of practitioners and philanthropists. And it really, really tugged at my soul because it's an experience that I've had 
um, that I almost feel like it's like, it's like you can take Williamsburg anywhere, right? So you can have like this farm to table beer, um, kind of bowling alley, like there's all these new urban- um, Axe throwing. Yeah. <laughs> all these new <laughs> urban months that are all, almost like the erasure you speak of in the book from everything from people no longer wanting to hear um, the, whatever the, cult, the cultural norm is. So, so like uh, around the country, we have music, regional sounds that express our culture. And through gentrification, we're usually the first things we want to get rid of are the juke joint, the church um, yeah. space, so on and so forth. But um, can you speak to two, two things I, I want you to touch on? One, I, I similarly have a love for Detroit. And when I started visiting Detroit, I realized that the things that were most familiar to me were how we responded to some of the same public policies. So like how Detroit responds to redlining or how Detroit responds to housing covenants. It, it's just like a different flavor. Like, so I see us being on a series of arpeggio islands with no communication no media, and the only time we can get together is usually when philanthropy or institutions bring us together. So even in the lab is an attempt for us to connect those dots. But so. it's also, but, it, but let me say this, it's also a responsibility of people like me to convene people. Uh, you, know, I, you know, and I don't take this lightly. I work at Brookings. When I go to a city, people come. And, and, and we do this for other economic development agencies and, and groups. We, we get folks from Phoenix to meet up with folks in Utah. We get people from LA to meet up. But when it comes to black people, we don't do that kind of convening. I mean, a lot of this, this book is about really accepting responsibility of what we should be doing. The efforts in Detroit are, are inextricably linked to the efforts in Philly to the efforts in New Orleans, to the efforts in Atlanta. And we've got to make those connections real. Because in DC, what I talk about in the book is how, I, I don't know if you know that, um, the, 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 about the Don't Mute DC mm -hmm. sort of campaign. And there was a, um, a PCS, a mobile P Metro PCS store that played uh, a a go-go music outside for 20 something years. They put up a, a, a large um, apartment complex across the street, largely, mostly white people living in it. They start complaining about the establishment. They say the music's too loud. Now, mind you, if you're at a, a business that went through DC for 20 something years, you are an asset to the city. If you survive DC during, during the good and bad times, you're an asset. The, the idea that they would attack an asset is asinine. But anyway, they, they complain so much they get the music taken down. The, the, the go go community rose up um, using the don't mute DC tag, literally took it to the street, used the culture as a um, a, a tool of resistance. It, you know, every city has t tools of resistance that they can then deploy to get what they want. I'm hoping that there's some cross-pollination that's going to occur. It won't be go-go, um, don't mute DC hashtag to be used in Detroit. It'll be something Detroit uses. But trust me when I say it will involve culture. It will involve something that is unequivocally Detroit that will resist, um, that will, will push strong. So my goal is to, sh to, to have that cross-pollination so cities can see, oh, there's strength between us. Um, there's actually talent between us that we have to, to share. But again, I put a lot of this on the muckety-mucks of the world who you know, who don't use whatever privileges they have to bring us together, you know? And I mean, and it, and it is it's very basic as, hey, when we're sending out our, um, uh, re for book reviews, asking people for book reviews, I'm very clear, get my, get my writers of color a book. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, I literally go through, I'm like, no, 
So there's, there's, there's something, something I, I want to touch on um, because, you know, whether through our, our past work with the Institute of Hip Hop Entrepreneurship or IFLAB, which actually stands for Idea Factory, um, we are attempting to give people a pathway to fiscal independence, all right? There's a portion of the book where you talk about a, a, a real estate developer and the challenges he had with uh, banking and the CDFI community or dealing with the um, malu of real estate and people trying to devalue what you have um, stake in. Can, can you speak to going from that uh, developer's experience to kind of um, retouching on black communities being $156 billion um, undercapitalized and how that money would go directly to us investing in ourselves. The crazy thing is the, I, I featured this guy by the name of Brian Rice in the book. He literally bought a block and it, in the, the chapter is called Buy Back the Block. And it's dedicated to all those folks who are trying to buy back the block. Um, because the thing about the valuation, the, the, the pr property values are so low, you can literally buy a block in many cities with friends and fr family capital. But um, he could not get um, money to develop the property because the, um, the appraisals came in essentially saying that his property was worth zero dollars. They gave him the, the wackest comps you, <laughs> you've ever seen. It, you know, it was, it's, it's a tragedy. And um, just a few days after, you know, a few weeks after I did this tour with them, I actually presented on Capitol Hill um, with the appraisal community. And Representative Al Green, and I narrate this in the book, Representative Al Green asked the panel that I'm on, um, did, do you, uh, d does, do you believe that there's housing discrimination causing this devaluation? I was the only one that raised their hand. The only one. Um, then he asked, do you believe there's no discrimination? <laughs> they, you know, it was like an all white panel that believes that there's no discrimination. And I, and I brought that up because there's, when you're in power, there's no incentive to change. And that's why the book is called Know Your Price. I ultimately do believe that it will take a movement to change the trajectory because people in power don't want a change. We are going to have to force it. And so, um, and that's that, you know, this, this is in the halls of Congress. Are you about to say something? Sorry. No, I was I was trying to think of a Frederick Douglass quote about oh it's um power concedes nothing without demand no, 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 yeah that's right yeah, yeah. so I, I want to be cognizant of, of uh, time we have about eighty one people in in the room uh, thank you everyone uh, it means wow. that we we could gather you for our our first engagement um, and we've got people from multiple cities um, I feel like I should call out Detroit uh, first because there's, there's a whole chapter on Detroit, as well as, you know, you touch on um, New Orleans, I think Cleveland, some other parts of the country. I see Laia St. Clair in the room. I, I feel privileged. Uh, I see Trey Johnson, who I want to shout out, who wrote a brilliant piece uh, speaking about music and gentrification and um, directly to some of the things I, I've experienced, I was talking about in different cities. Um, I see my brother James Wright from People's Emergency Center here. Um, but uh, does anyone want to address a question to Andre? I jump in the chat or maybe ask um, to be unmuted. Actually also tell you, I I think there's, a, there's a chapter on entrepreneurship that I thought might be interesting to touch on um, for this conversation as well, but. Yeah, I'll I'll, well, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Hey. Yes. Uh, yes. How you? How you doing, brother? Pre appreciate oh, well. your, appreciate everything. I haven't read your book, unfortunately. I'm learning about it now, but just wanted to ask you about Detroit currently, in terms of just what, if you could sort of catalog some of the creative things that people are doing to, you know, really resurrect Detroit. I mean, you know, a lot of us who aren't from there, we always hear that Detroit hustles harder. 
And um, I'm just curious if you could just sort of talk about some of the, the creativity uh, that's going into, that's coming out of the community that we could all learn from. I know that people like Grace Boggs and others, um, you know, who were, you know, fixtures in Detroit over the last 25, 30 years uh, have done a tremendous you know, amount of work on the ground. I'm just wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about some of that and what, what we can learn. Is it possible that uh, Chase can get on the line? Because actually some of the folks who are doing incredible work in Detroit are actually on the line. And what's awesome. interesting, they, they are both advocates entre and entrepreneurs and policymakers at the same damn time. You know, oh, nice. because they what, have to be. So go to Chase, Detroit and nobody puts you in touch with Chase. Um, Lauren. I know he's on here, right? Is yeah, it, I'm on. Hey, guys. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> Good to see you, brother. Good to see you, too. Um, wow, there's a, there's a lot of things happening in Detroit. Um, you know, we, we have a very unique situation in terms of, of real estate, especially. We have the largest land bank in the nation. Our land bank um, holds over 90,000 parcels of land. So, uh, you know, we have almost at least 24 acres of vacant land in the city. So it's, it's, it's crazy when you think about what that does just um, to a community to see, to see that um, and to understand the kinds of systems that operated on people to create that in the first place. Um, but since we're in this situation now, there's, there's a lot of innovation around what do we do with the physical environment. Um, personally, I've been working on um, teaching and training other Detroiters about real estate development. So giving them the tools to understand how you do it, how you access capital, um, how you access governmental resources, um, how you build a network of other developers who are doing neighborhood development. And this is at, this is the, this is at a small scale, right? So this is buying, by the, buying back the block, buying small commercial spaces, so things that are accessible to, to neighborhood developers. Um, and then Lauren Hood is also on. Lauren and I oh. both do a lot of work around um, just leading conversations like this in, in communities. Um, you know, it, we, we try to make sure that it's not top down, that we're, that we're getting authentic Detroit voices to, to learn what we're doing and to, to get those sort of creative ideas from community members who, you know, whose stories are not typically uplifted, so. And also this from an organized standpoint, they, um, um, Lauren and, and Chase and, and others brought me in for an organization called um, Urban Consulate. Mm -hmm. um, so there are uh, actually a number of organizations that are really leading the charge in, in, in Detroit. And so that's another thing that's going there. So there's organizational efforts to help mobilize the black community. I should just note though, there, there's still the complication of who funds it. Yeah, right? that's right. Um, you know, we're, we're funded, I'm funded by the Knight Foundation and Ford Foundation, Urban Consulate, similar kinds of philanthropic support. Um, there's a lot of questions in, in all of these cities, right? Detroit, Philly, Baltimore, Memphis, et cetera, about how do you, how do you fund the work that actually has real world change? Um, and that's something we talk about a lot. Like how do, how do we actually pull the right resources from the right people? And what's interesting that that's where, when I talk about that 156 billion, you know, a lot of that, those resources, you wouldn't have to go to philanthropy right? if it was in the community. And so there's a dependency and there's certainly some good um, um, uh, philanthropic organizations in Detroit and others, but they have an outsized influence on what goes on in places like Detroit because we've lost value in our in, in home properties. Can I can I speak um, towards that a little bit? Uh, it's okay. Gerald Cooper here. Hi, um, sorry. I'm, it's, hey, T. So I'm actually in the hood right now. Somebody's um, cutting the grass, so I apologize if uh, if the sound is a little off. Um, this, and thank you, Chase, for um, that information and 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 that that's really enlightening to like a lot of the a lot of those things that we don't always get to hear. Um, you know, in North America, um, black folks have this amazing, we have to hear from, it's a, centered in North America, so I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio right now, one of the, the last stops on the Underground Railroad that a lot of our folks took north. 
entertainment and, and uh, culture is our biggest export. And there's this huge disconnection between civic work, work that Chase is doing, work that Andre is doing, and how, um, you know, entertainment and culture can connect to it. And I just heard this, this interesting thing where now there's even this, this gap in the civic world, in the civic side of it, you know, the funding, again, even from a, a Knight Foundation, and then this disconnection to like how Nike or, um, you know, you know, uh, some of these for-profit entities can can get involved with this stuff, and I and I see this amazing connection between with, with culture and entertainment. So I I've been helping out Jay Z's audio engineer and his music director, Young Guru, for a decade, mm -hmm. and I've really been doing a great. Well, I think we've been doing a decent job in that connection um, of uh, of this. You know, we would bring our interns to uh, set up Jay's show and we would then write Jay's shows off of Guru's tax book because we would then write off because we because he was teaching and it was just like this thing that all of my boys are like bro like how you know how are you doing that and so a lot of a lot of the kids in entertainment have no clue that they could be doing this work but then also I think that we there's a there's a reshaping that we can connect the social enterprise um, since the B, B Corp legislation and since social enterprise has become essentially the calling card, uh, the calling card for, sorry, I got to call it. Uh, it's become the calling card for Facebooks and Instagrams as to get involved. Uh, there's this really cool synergy of like kids getting in, let's say real estate. Kids won't, like, there's no, there's no, there's not a lot of people who are going to get into real estate just raw dogs. Right. Like just like, oh, I want to get into it. Like, what's the more popular way to show to like get kids interested? It was always my things. And when I say kids, I mean anybody under 100 years old. Gerald, and so Gerald, if I, I, not, not to cut you off, because I want to be res respectful to everyone's time. And um, yeah, you and I have, have, have talked about um, some of these issues in the past and, and, and um, not to speak for Andre, but, you know, I learned entrepreneurship and I got my chops and my confidence in um, being everything from a roadie to uh, an A&R to um, executive producing albums. And um, frankly, one of the things that got me to leave entertainment was I saw so many brothers and sisters who had um, this incredible agency and ability to make uh, culture move, but frankly had um, a cognitive dissonance about using that power within civic spaces, within public policy spaces, within taking that same energy and um, reimagining our own communities. So I know that you operate in that intersection, but I also know that we share people who have all about the bag mentality that right. is in, in alignment with, uh, I think, uh, Palo Frio said that, um, you learn power by emulating the oppressor if you're an oppressor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Some of us, go and ahead. So, but, but, real, but real quick, Andre, real quick, and thank you. Uh, Andre, go on. We're, we're, we're real quick, real quick. I'm speaking more about the intersection and not the people on either side. Okay. So right. just FYI, go ahead. Yeah, because I was going to say, you know, one of my taglines is there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. That we have people who are, you, you know how to hustle, know how to create businesses, know how to sustain business, know how to run white people businesses. Um, and, and we're maxing out on that. You know, I actually think that um, at some point, we just need the capital and investment in the people who know how to do. And, and so for me, I, this book is saying, hey, we have no choice but to leverage the assets that we have. So when you're in Detroit, you got to maximize housing some way, some shape or form, because it's an asset is not invested in at, at the levels we would like, but it's there in front of us. And we got to make it work. If you're in the music industry, music, music industry is a hustle in itself, but we got to yeah. maximize it. My brother who works at the NBA is in, in, in here, you know, the NBA is not necessarily, I mean, it's still a, a, uh, a major uh, 
uh, sports franchise that, you know, when you're talking about the overall um, perspective, owners are getting over on everybody <laughs> in this society. And people are within these structures finding power. So I'm like, hey, you know, I never knock people's hustle. I never knock, I never say that people need to learn or do this. My whole goal is say, hey, we have talent, we have assets, they need investment. And so I'm always like, where, you know, nobody, nobody um, invests in problems. That's why when I produce a lot of research, I try not to produce the same kind of disparity research that, sh that essentially says black folk need to catch up to white folk. I show, oh, here's the talent, here's the assets that are, are strong, let's direct investment into those people and places and things and, and growth will occur. So I'm, I'm constantly like, l let's find, let's work with our strength, not with our, our, our deficits because that just feeds into the narrative that we're broken, that we don't know how. And when in fact, it's, it's something much larger than that at play in my mind. That's the, that's, that's the perspective of the book. It's, we have assets, we have strength, we have knowledge, we have skills. They are devalued. But, and I don't want to diminish um, the, the, um, that sort of phenomenon. I just got a text from uh, Senator Hughes. He said, do the Detroit folk know Susan Shank? Um, email me, let, let me know. Let, let's make some connections. Um, a couple other people that I, I see in the chat. My brother Christopher Coes down at DC, uh, definitely someone. Oh wow! People should know. Uh, my brother Larry uh, Larry Osei, uh, Mister Everywhere. You never know. Well, he was. Let me tell you about Chris Coes. That you know we have again talent everywhere. If you want somebody, <laughs> he is like the encyclopedia on community development, economic development, no question. You know, what I, and I essentially listen to folks like you, you know, I have an easy job because what I do is I listen to folks like you and Chris, and then I say, well, let me just test it. And yeah, then, actually, and then I, I write it. I have a funny story and I, I owe Chris an apology because you invited me to, uh, the, the press club in DC to a panel and I, I panel, you know, panel, panel city to city. And my brother invited me to the first panel. When I got off stage, people were like, well, what you got? What can I invest in? Like I had, I was shook. I had, ne I was, had never been in a room where there were multiple people saying, all right, what a deal at? What can I invest in? And yeah. I wasn't ready that day. So Chris, um, invite me more out because I will never, <laughs> that will never happen again. <laughs> Chris don't, Chris doesn't invite, he doesn't invite me to those things. <laughs> uh, so I think we, we have about, like, you know, 10, 15 more minutes. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. And again, uh, now we, we almost got about 70 people in the room and I really appreciate everyone. Y'all better order the book while y'all watching me on. <laughs> Hashtag. Buy my brother's book. Um, no, but 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 buy it and try to go through a you know your local indie, you know um, go try to order through them. You know a lot of the local indies don't have online outlets. I've been encouraging folks to on to go through online outlets. You can also if you go to the web page for the book at the Brooking site, it go it, it will take you to booklist.com or bookshop.com. I'm sorry, and you can select from local. Um, vendors, but try to support your local vendors at this time. Me and you had a point. Uncle Bobby's, yes. Yeah, just to let everyone know, we're going to be sending out um, a, a synopsis email following this to let everyone know where they can access the book, uh, a little bit more description around the book, um, as well as more description around the series in general. So uh, that, that will definitely be covered. Um, we're sorry that we didn't send it out ahead of this, which we should have. Um, I would really like to spend the the last few minutes of this conversation with two things. The first is, again, the chapter on entrepreneurship, if we could just touch on that. But also, second, just rounding it out with a few 
I don't, I don't know. Um, actionable items, because I think we all like to end these conversations with things that we feel that we have agency over. Um, so I, I think that that might be also a nice place to end this as well. Well, there, there's the one thing in terms of entrepreneurship, the one chapter I really, because there, there are actually two places where I talk about entrepreneurship. I'll talk about one. And that is on the buy back the block thing. And the re reason why I, I, I talk about it's more real estate development slash entrepreneurship is because I've always um, believed that our entrepreneurs um, should be um, um, located in areas that can then help accelerate the development of neighborhoods. And when in one of the concrete things I put in the book, uh, book it's, it's the smart block uh, strategy where we're essentially buying property in former commercial corridors um, and making sure that we have sort of first order businesses. So you have your grocery stores, your um, coffee shops and things like that, of, of food stores, barber shops, but you also have high growth industries incubated on those streets. The, but the, 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 the goal is we, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that's not necessarily leading to community growth. And the story about Black Wall Street or Richmond or in all these other places where you saw these massive transformations of communities only to be thwarted by um, white supremacy, it, but there, we can do this. It's been done before. Um, and it's being done now. And so I just basically look throughout history because everybody points to Black Wall Street, but there have been countless places all throughout the country where folks are not only developing their businesses, but they're developing community at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm tr trying to reinforce that it's not necessarily about just grabbing the bag. It's also about developing the community. And, and so that's what, you know, a, a theme that is important to me, that it's not just about a business. It's about changing our view, perspective of value, that our communities have value and we're supposed to add to it with our businesses, with our, with our schools, with our, and with our other efforts. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, a couple other people uh, I, I just want to reference. Um, Nikki Jean is, is, is tuned in. Uh, Cassie Owens at the Inquirer. Tahit Chappelle at the Free Press. Uh, my brother Brian Mary at Shift Capital. Woo! Uh, Woo! In Miami. If you, if you don't know Esther Yoon. Uh, you're bringing them out, brother. Um, you're, you're, you are the you are the street team. Uh, I told you that. <laughs> this is, this is like we back like loud records in '94. This is a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, Oscar, um, any other uh, questions? That I just want to open open it up because I don't want to monopolize the time, and I want to be respectful of your time, um, Andre. Anyone, hands, hands, hands. Anyone else? You know, sure, you're positive? You know your price? You got the twenty four ninety nine. dollars Know your well, price? <laughs> Canning, you had a question? Yeah, I wanted to say, just, just to that last point, I mean, the, I, I like that. I love what you said about sort of developing and fostering community. My question is, when we think about the Black Wall Street, so we think about Black Detroit, or we, you know, a lot of times we're talking about, you know, segregation and segregated communities. Yeah. Now we're not in, you know, uh, legally segregated communities. So the question is, how do we still deal with these kinds of class cleavages that, that inhibit the kind of community development I think that you s seem to want to, you know, that you're envisioning, which I think is really important. But I'm just trying to understand how we think about that in the 21st century. Um, well, because so much of our references and so much of our point of reference harkens to another time where the 
historical conditions were just so much more different than they are now. Wait, well, I will say this. Donna <laughs> Frisbee Greenwood <laughs> just called me out. I didn't know you were here, Donna. <laughs> if it were not for Donna Frisbee Greenwood, Taib probably would not uh, be here with y'all today. So <laughs> fully apologize. Go on, Andre. <laughs> Yeah, what's interesting about places, uh, and this may happen in Detroit, uh, you know, I, I think it, it will happen. While integration, there, there's no rush to integration, really. Right, right, um, right. You're, there, there is starting to develop more socioeconomic integration. So there's a lot of more places in place like D.C. where the black middle class, the brown middle class, um, and and low income folks are living together, so you see that more in in you know Maryland, D.C. as you you see in in some places where gentrification has taken hold, blacks have moved in the suburbs, low income and middle income um, blacks, and and in school districts, you're starting to see more um, um, socioeconomic. Um, integration, not necessarily racial integration, but I actually am hopeful that places, because people are tired of commuting, they want to come back to the core, They're, and, and, and younger Black people are moving, um, upwardly mobile Black people moving in the hood. Mm -hmm. I just think we got to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have to take advantage of that. Yes, and, and, and for many folks, it, it will feel rough. But mm -hmm. many young, middle-class, college-educated folk are moving back in the hood. And that, for me, is encouraging. Because mm -hmm. right now, you know, well, not right now, because I was going to say the barbershop may be one, one of the few places you can get socioeconomic diversity. Mm -hmm. um, maybe church. I mean, even that's changing. Now you got bougie churches, <laughs> you know? I, I, you know I, but that's, that's a whole... Second. That's a whole nother story. But I do think that there's, going to, there's a movement to have more socioeconomic diversity, um, not necessarily racial diversity in a lot of these cities. And that's going to help accelerate um, what I think is good in, in, um, in community. I, I, I agree with you. Thank something. you. Something I've been saying a lot recently is that oftentimes the people uh, put in power are placed in power because right. they're not in alignment with the median Black experience. Um, right. Oscar, did you have a question? I thought I saw you right. raise your hand. Yeah, I think uh, on this topic, it makes me think about something that Andre and I chatted about last week when we were talking about the book. And... I, th I thought it'd be worth bringing up here because when we think about integration and segregation and structural violence and changing the way the economy works, one, one thing that the book made me think about was the, the, the real difference between remediating or rectifying the racial wealth gap in the form of reparations and dealing with that as a historical problem that's one thing, and it's separate from dealing with the fact that we have an entire economic system built around rewarding wealth and, and, and creating access to investment, to jobs, to education, to neighborhoods based on wealth. That's right. And, and that's a, that, that will be there even if we have reparations. That's still a problem. The second part about the, 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 the economic system is still there, even if you have reparations and you have to fix that part too. You have to do both. And it's, it could be an interesting challenge to kind of this, it's a, it could be an interesting discussion to have to like figure out, well, how do you spend the political capital wherever you are to do one or the other at, at any given moment? And that's the, um, I'm, I'm glad you touched on that because um, oftentimes people use my research in the reparations discussion because I put dollar amounts on what's lost. Um, you know, and I, I'm a, I'm a reparations supporter um, and we need that. I'm working, my, my research falls in the lane of fix these structures that are also throttling black 
growth. Um, and so I'm a both and person um, because one, we're owed reparations. I mean, that, that's just a moral debt. And I don't care, uh, you know, some of the most racist language I get on my Twitter feed, I block people all the time is when they say things like black people can't handle money and blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's, it's the most crazy thing um, you, you can hear, but you, you need both. The people, and this is important in this time, um, it, this is very similar to the 30s where you're going to see um, people hungry in the street, um, jobless. The way those folks overcame was not by with their financial literacy, not be from their uh, manipulation of assets. It was because the federal government um, gave them they cut a check for them. It was it came in the form of low interest loans. It came in the form of social security. And it, they left out black people from the new deal for much of the new, new deal. We need a new, new deal. There's no question about that. And so, stop saying that we have got to work within the confines of inequality in order to make it. That's just, you know, um, so I want to deal with the structures but I also want to deal with the reality. There are times in order to progress, you need a check cut. Um, and, and so we need both. We need both. So I just want to double down on what you just said about the New Deal policies, because a lot of people um, seem to write out of history that service workers and people who worked in agriculture who were Black um, were written out of the New Deal. And then there were a handful of people um, who were able to participate through the WPA, through the arts, um, through, That's the right. poverty, through theater. So some of the most heralded artists that we know of the 21st century were able to make it through rough times in working for the government. Everyone from Gordon Parks to Ansel Adams to I think Langston Hughes got w uh, WPA money. But today in Philadelphia, our um, budgets are being zeroed out. The Workforce Development Office is no longer as um, proposed in the new budget. Um, the Office of Arts and Culture is no longer. And there's now a neoliberal reactionary, um, and I will borrow from Naomi Klein's uh, shock doctrine language, that when something happens, you gut the budgets, you lay off staff, you, you take people away from the possibility of pensions, and then you put those services to private market um, resources that come on the other side. So we have to be um, very cognizant of the history and how the history speaks to today and how um, oftentimes if you don't pay attention to, to public policy, you can be bamboozled. <clears throat> and, and let's be clear, like essential workers should be federalized. So like, so the, during times like this, it's the Grubhub drivers that should have benefits pay and protection, that we're already putting them in harm's way. We're putting them in more harm's way when we don't take care of them economically. We basically said, hey, we can't have the economy shut down completely. You're gonna to have to work grocery store worker. You're gonna to have to work um, um, gas store, uh, gas station agent. These are the jobs that should be federalized. And they should have the same kind of benefits as um, uh, civil servants. And, you know, this is how you get out of a recession or a depression. Um, the, these are the times to really think big, because if we're going to keep working on the edges, we're going to be in the same situation when the next um, inevitable crisis occurs. We need big action. And don't tell me we don't have the money. Just last Woo. few weeks ago, we um, purchased all kind of bad debt and found three, $3 billion out of nowhere. So don't tell me that you, you can't find the money to do this. There's enough money. And it, we, but we just don't have the will because we don't value black people. And so the goal of this book is to show people, hey, we have to stand on a price. I will, I, not to close, but I just want to explain where the Know Your Price came from. 
because a, a lot of people don't know. Know Your Price um, comes from my favorite play in the whole wide world, Two Trains Running. In the play, the main character, Memphis, is about to have his property seized through eminent domain by the city of Pittsburgh. The city of Pittsburgh offers um, uh, Memphis $15,000. The main character goes, no, I'm not selling my property for $15,000. I got my price, I know my price. Um, I'm paraphrasing. And it's a refrain throughout the play. I'm not selling my, my, my building, I got my, I know my price. There's another character, Hambone, who paints a fence for a ham, for a, to, for a proprietor, he paints a fence he never gets his ham. The, the character Hambone goes, give me my ham, give me my ham, give me my ham. And we don't know if he's crazy before that, but he eventually goes crazy and dies. But there's actually a happy ending. You know, whenever I tell that, people go, damn, that's kind of <laughs> sad. But there's a ha ha um, happy ending. The main character, Memphis, gets $35,000, well over his asking price. And it's assumed he's getting um, the white rate. The, the, the point of it is you better know you have worth, but more importantly, you better know what price you have to stand on. We've got to stand on our price, even if it means going crazy and dying. And so that's, that's what this book is trying to get at. Hey, I'm going to give you some metrics, but we need to get together, people. We need to get together. So that leaves me because I think um, everyone's time is starting to come to an end. Um, and I would like to leave it with one one question. Um, just because I, I've heard of a new New Deal before, I feel like all of these things we're talking about are so sweeping and they're so necessary. Yeah. But I think the question is, is how do we as individuals or we as business owners or we as just people standing alone, <clears throat> What are the small things we can do to help affect these sweeping changes that need to be made? And during this period of time, how can the small business owners survive? Um, now, okay, so um, there's a couple of things that I talk about, um, and you'll see this. Uh, so after this book release, I'll be releasing a series of videos of people who are actually doing this stuff so the 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 lauren hoods the the chases the you know the my uh, brian rice in um in um uh, in birmingham um my, my people in in um new orleans there's actually people demonstrating how to um create different loan products or they're they're buying the blocks they're creating um, businesses that Im improve neighborhoods. So I, I just want to say, you you folks are already doing it. <laughs> so one of the things I, I, I always say, you know, as a researcher, you know, I think people lie when they say they're doing all this original research. They're not. They're just going to people like you and, and asking you, what are you doing? And I get to put it in a book and sell it. <laughs> you know, but the, so you're you all are doing it and so the examples in the book are actual examples that can be taken to scale if they are invested in so it's so i, I would just challenge you just a little bit it's not that we're not doing anything we're actually doing a lot <laughs> it's just not getting the investment that's what's missing and if we can com compel congress and states and cities. Like for instance, every city should have a, um, a, a social impact fund in which they are starting new businesses because of the loss of devaluation. Every city, this is the time right now to, to refresh your procurement list at cities, right? Because um, not while people are working, cities are actually busy. And so they can actually put many of these businesses that need work in business, um, um, cities uh, um, have also the um, opportunity to um, actually hire people who are out of work. What will happen, businesses will close at a rate in which folks will be forced into the workforce. Cities should be hiring those people in critical areas. Mm -hmm. um, at the state level, um, we do need tax abatement for people, for low-income people living, living in areas that are gentrifying. And so we need policies for that.
So, you know, so there are concrete steps that we can take. Um, clearly, I'm, I want to diversify the appraisal industry. The appraisal industry is 90% white. It's appraisal, appraisal is generally run by the state. That needs to change because you see how representation matters in, in appraisals. And so there are concrete policy things um, that I propose, but, you know, but the reality is you are an example of what we need. We just need to get you investment. Thank you so much. Um, there's, there's a lot. I, I feel like once you get out on the road um, and the mother people get a hold of you, uh, we reserve the right to, to call you back for part two. Uh, no, no. Look, let me tell you, there's some cities, I'm, I'm about to set up shop in, in, in Detroit and in Philly in, yeah. uh, for real. <laughs> Y'all think I'm joking. Because <laughs> whenever I go there, I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm having too good of a time. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to seriously, I'm going to have a small little apartment, Midtown and, you know, a little apartment in South Philly right there, New Orleans. Okay. Don't sleep. All right, so um, before I go, I want to also mention uh, Brittany Foreman. Yeah. Brittany, I, I see you on here. Um, Brittany is running uh, for the, state uh, representative. Is, is that correct, Brittany? Um, sister, you want to say something real quick? Don't, don't be shy. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Taib, for inviting me and um, really appreciate uh, Everything that I've heard so far, I actually I was only able to jump on for the last about 20, 30 minutes. Um, but yeah, so I'm running for state representative out in Delaware County, about 25 minutes um, outside of the city and in the middle of Delaware County. Um, and I, I don't know, I have a passion for building strong communities, uh, you know, places where families and businesses thrive and where no one's left behind. Um, and so a lot of the things that you guys have been talking about is uh, something that is near and dear to my heart. And even though that I'm in a majority, uh, it's probably the district that I'm in is about 95% white. So yep. um, even though I'm out in that area, you know, I'm still looking to be in Harrisburg to be in a place where I can support these issues um, across the state. So, so yeah. the you know what, can I, I can can book, he addresses why we need to vote for black women and why black women's health is, is good for community health overall. Uh, so Brian, go. I mean, yeah. Andre, go. Can I, yeah. Can I just say that I state in the book, I showed the, the study I did with Higher Heights, how black women, get, um, they don't necessarily need to run in majority black places. You know, the template was black men, largely preachers, largely educators would essentially run for office and they would generally come from majority black districts. Over the last um, five to 10 years, you're seeing the emergence of black women getting elected in non-majority, I mean, in, in largely white districts essentially. Um, and they're doing well because black women um, transcend socioeconomic class. So black women understand what's going on in poverty. They understand what's going on with criminal justice. They understand what's going on in, in the corporate boardrooms. They understand what it means to be successful. And so when, you, when you're um, electing someone, black women resonate with all kinds of, of folks. So I say, hey, that's a great place to be in. When you're a black woman, it could be 90% white. You've got a really good shot. So thank keep you. Going. Keep thank going. you. Yeah, we're 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 seeing that um, in the district, and I will tell you um, that there's only 52 women in the state legislature out of 203, and there are only nine women of color. And so we have a long ways to go in Pennsylvania, um, but I think that we have a really good opportunity with this district in this in this moment. So, so you're, yeah, I'll I'll end with. Um, even though this is supposedly a nonpartisan space, that uh, Senator Hughes would tell you he had to leave. But I think if we flip five or six seats, um, Pennsylvania will go um, blue. Yeah, so on the Senate side, I think it's only four seats. And then in House, it's nine seats. And so um, I'm actually running in a top targeted seat to flip, so. 
Let's go. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. <laughs> Let's do it. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for being a part of this. Uh, Andre, I will talk to you soon. All right. Well, thanks for having me. To everyone also for participating. We really appreciate it. And we'll be sending you out follow-up information about this as well as for future ones. And you guys are amazing. This is a great group. Have a great bye week. Bye-bye.